Good afternoon to all of you. So wonderful to know that there are so many of you eager to learn about school culture, especially in this time of great change. And uh, going forward, we can see that the change keeps on coming, doesn't it? Uh, not less because COVID-19 isn't stopping and uh, seems to be having a second run in some of our countries. So change is inevitable, but how do we face this change? We have seen that we can manage change better in a safe environment of trust and goodwill. This environment basically is the culture of your school. And we believe that the leaders of the schools and the community contribute significantly to this. Please see that principal is a CCS. CCS stands for Chief Culture and Shaper of a Positive School Culture. Principal as Chief, meaning you need to have a clear vision and mission for your school. And if ever, you need to translate it or trans be transparent to all your teachers and staff of what is your goal for your school. You need to set guidelines on how to monitor school personnel, students, and even the community. A principal is also a role model of positivity and principal various actions should reinforce activities in the school. Principal as culture. As a school principal in a healthy culture, never forget that you are the role model. You should be organized, you should be visible to all stakeholders. Communicate regularly and purposely. Be passionate about your work. Accept responsibility for the school culture and always exhibit a positive outlook. So what are my takeaways? School culture and the impact on leadership style. School leaders greatly influence the change or preservation of the culture in a school. These behavior, norms, and beliefs sometimes challenge the leadership style of the principal or motivate him to improve the school performance and school setting. And remember that leaders are actors who play out the vision and values. Another thing, before you try to change the school culture, understand first the old one and find out the most effective subculture in the organization and use it as a model. And the most important thing, never forget to communicate to your teachers, parents, and students regarding the changes in the school culture that you want them to embrace. Help them to do their jobs as they learn to adapt with the new culture. Culture is the shadow of the leader. Wow. When you say culture is the shadow of the leader, we think that principals come and go in a school. Am I right? They never stay there forever. But the people they work with every day will remember every bit of their leadership style and managing style. How the principal treated them differently, how they touched their lives. So whether positive or negative, that will be their trademark in their school. So it's up to the principal, how do you want to leave your mark? for everyone to remember you. I think uh, you have been in, a, in that sense, sharing your journey of coming into a new school and trying to understand what it was before you try to make any changes. And in, the, and in the process of finding out what it was, you came across all these steps about that. While the artifacts were the easiest to see, yet at the same time, you knew you had to go deeper into yes. what were some of the underlying assumptions. And then after that, to go right down to the deep beliefs. And I think uh, every school leader here will uh, uh, knows this, that knowing the deep beliefs of the people in your school is the most difficult. Yes, it most is. Most difficult sometimes to find out, Yes, but also the most difficult to change 
after you have found out that, oh no, that's not what I want. And, uh, and that indeed is uh, what happens uh, when you are on this journey of school leadership. So the key really to building culture is leadership. And I took this from uh, Learners Now and uh, allow me to read this segment. The school takes the personality of their principal. If the principal is mean, the staff will be mean to one another and the kids, and the kids will be mean to one another. If the principal is full of energy, excitement and enthusiasm, the teachers will be energized to teach and the students will be excited about learning. The principal can extinguish a flame of positivity or ignite a flame of hope. The principal is responsible for the culture and mood of the school. How I worked with my staff to identify the desired culture for the organization. Based on my own experience uh, as a senior quality assessor, I, I realized that it is important for everybody to understand and know what is the desired culture that we want for the organization. If not, there would not be clarity and we will not all be on the same page. So sometimes in my work as an assessor, I found that uh, when I interviewed the staff, uh, different staff mentioned different aspects of culture. And I think for everybody to gel together, it is important to uh, have a common understanding of what the organizational culture is. And so I set out with my school and it was done together with all the staff to first unpack the school core values, which was PRIDE. PRIDE actually is the acronym, uh, which means uh, perseverance, uh, respect, integrity, diligence, and empathy. These are the school core values. So building culture has to be anchored on values. And we unpack the values for staff and the students. And we all understood these were our school values. And then we said, what is the culture that we want, that we desire for the organization? And after uh, an identification of the culture and the gap, culture gap review, we decided that the culture of care and culture of learning and innovation will be the culture that we want for the organization. So what this means is that while beliefs and values are core to shaping a positive culture, it is certainly not enough. So the question is, what are the barriers to enacting the espoused values? Is it about motivation? No reason to behave in a particular manner because there is no consequence perhaps. Or is it about the lack of competence, little self-awareness? lose supervision, or a case of lack of support, no time and space, and perhaps expertise or help provided to do the right things? Could it be even conflicting values? Um, school um, looking at efficiency instead of efficacy? Or do we demand autonomy from our teachers and yet want to make sure that they are aligned? Or perhaps even a misalignment of personal values with the organizational values, what we call a misfit. The teacher does not have the teaching dispositions that will make her or him a good, effective teacher. So in making sense of this complexity, we can ask ourselves the following questions. Is it something identifiable? Is it something actionable? And if it's identifiable and actionable, then we probably can measure this and if we are clear and, and we get clarity um, of these cultural elements that are identifiable and actionable, we probably will be starting on our culture building journey. But the key point here is that while we work on schools programs to implement, uh, to achieve our desired goals, we must pay attention to the cultural fabric right, that uh, would support the implementation of the program. Peter Drucker coined the term culture eats strategies for breakfast, um, meaning that it doesn't matter how detailed and fantastic and inspiring your strategic plan is, if you don't have the culture that supports it, then everything can fail. Here we see the first one, clear vision and mission. 
of the school actually is the foundation of every plan ahead. So what matters to one school may be different to others. So our schools decided that morning routine was important to be implemented and the discipline of students also need to be built up. That's why we changed or we adjust roles and rules. If before pandemic, we use the one in school base, but after pandemic, we call it class base. What is school base and what is class base? The responsibilities of morning routine that we uh, did it before in auditorium and uh, and uh, responsibility of teachers on duty is no longer only a uh, responsibility of particular teachers, but the implementation of school rule and regulation also is the responsibility of all teachers in the hands of all teachers. The morning routines is the responsibility on the hand in, in on the hand of homeroom teachers. So we change role from school base to class base, from teachers on duty to homeroom teachers or subject teachers. And also the most important thing here, during online learning here, it's difficult to give proper consequences just like before pandemic. So during online learning, the consequences given is focused to enhance students' awareness and build connection in relationship between students, teachers, and schools. So there's a swift in roles and rules here. So communication actually takes important role in building relationship. The last principles here is we need to embrace all school members to support the implementation of school rule and regulation. School leaders, homeroom teachers, subject teachers, students, and parents must get involved to uphold the disciplines issued in schools. So in this online uh, learning, homeroom take an important part. Okay, next, we need to communicate clearly about our objective to teachers. So not only uh, set up homeroom, also all teachers must get involved to this process. Also communicate to parents and students. To uphold the discipline, we need the involvement of all school members. That's why it's important to communicate clearly the objective to teachers so every teacher also can make a regulation agreement in their virtual class. So every teacher make a, their regulation agreement so that align to school objective. That's why we need to uh, embrace all teachers to uphold all uh, the regulation in our school. As you can, uh, we can all see that certainly when uh, when lockdowns and uh, and uh, remote learning is is necessary, that schools have to do a lot of adjustment, and we saw all that adjustment being made uh, in your presentation. What we also saw was that you realized that it was not just coming from the top, not just about principal and vice principal, but really you were relying so much on the relationship that you would have with your teachers. And I think uh, what I saw was that you, you started to rely a lot on the homeroom teachers, that they sort of had little mini schools of their own. They kept that culture going. So that's, that's uh, really a step forward uh, instead of just pretending that everything will just have to go on, but you made use, you took advantage of the fact that you had these teachers and you made them homeroom teachers and developed a relationship with them. 
So in Boon Lay Secondary, students do not have a form class or a homeroom. This must be mind boggling for many of you. We may be the only school in the region and possibly the world without form classes. The school is the extension of the natural family and the CCA, the child's family in school where, te where teachers act, at, uh, act in place of parents. Students are like siblings to each other. The same CCA teachers will be the single point of contact for four to five years with parents. CCA teachers meet with parents at least twice a year and on other informal uh, occasions, communications were frequent according to the needs and, and situation. Parents are also encouraged to join the school in events and celebration. So what is so special about this family of learners in Woodley Secondary? This is where CCA teachers act as parents to care and guide each child in their growth and development. Teacher mentor the seniors who then induct the juniors into the CCA group and into the life and norms of the school. The CCA family is not merely a replacement of the form class or homeroom. It is a unifying identity formed from the enduring relationship in the family within the CCA. However, students are not grouped by CCA for academic lessons. Students move to their respective teaching groups as representative of their CCAs to attend academic lessons appropriate to their level and course. Students are only grouped by CCA for non-academic lessons and projects. If you think no form class is uh, radical, then add to it that there are no prefects, no house system. It is the CCA leaders who form the student council and manage school routines. Now the prerequisite for a learning culture in a school is that there must be shared belief that every child is capable of learning and succeeding. A high priority must be given to maintaining positive, caring relationships in the school and a safe environment, you know, devoid of uh, free, you know, of bullying and other kind of dangers that may prevent students from learning must be provided so that everyone dares to learn, dares to try out new ideas and dares to take risk. At Kochuan Presbyterian Secondary School, teachers invest heavily in relationships with their students. They spend time on a regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with students to get to know them as individuals. Driven by the belief that every child can learn, they seek to understand the reasons for lackluster performance and inappropriate behavior. And they try to be part of the solution so that the child is able to get back on his feet. Most teachers will stay with their classes for two years, two consecutive years. Information gathered about the child is recorded and handed over to the next teacher in the third year. In this way, the school is able to support the child adequately throughout the four or five years that they will be with us. At Kochuan Presbyterian Secondary, we also believe that strong peer relationships are good soil for nurturing a strong culture of learning. Structures are in place to promote positive peer relationships resulting in peers looking out for one another and strengthening the culture of learning in the school. Peer bonding begins the minute a new cohort comes into the school. Student leaders are attached to each class to help bond the class and promote the school culture of care and collaboration. New students soon learn about the culture and adapt to the school culture. After the formal orientation program is over, student leaders will continue to journey with the class, meeting them on a weekly basis for the next 10 weeks until the class has comfortably settled in. Healthy peer relationships results in peers supporting one another in their learning, meeting in groups after school to complete their homework and assignments, coaching one another according to their strengths and being cooperative in their combined projects. Now, in this picture, we see the secondary one students in their first year, they're, they're working together on a class banner that unites them and holds them together, gives them a sense of identity as a class. And this is a group of second, two secondary four students. This class decided to put up little letter boxes in their class where they would leave notes of encouragement to their peers in the run up 
to the national exams. So sustaining a positive school culture during the pandemic, but it, it was already a challenge for us, you know, with the various things that we had to encounter during the pandemic. But we, uh, we were fortunate in the sense that we had a very good, caring, collaborative culture uh, and a, a high level of camaraderie amongst the staff. So we, con but we continue to pay attention to the following, learning and well-being needs of our staff, needs of our students. And we kept spirits up and encouraged all to look at the positives. So one of the refrains that you hear in my presentation is that we looked at the positives. We looked at uh, the, half, the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. So working from home was, like I said, something new, right? Uh, and whilst it might seem, you know, it, it, normally we come to school to work, but what I found was that teachers spent a lot more time working at home than if they were working from school. And in addition to that, they also had to mind their own kids, those of the, the, the teachers who had their own children, because the, their children were also in, at home. And the teachers, while they had to care for the students, they also had to mind their own children who were at home. And, and, and I, the reason how, how what we came through this is because of the empathy that we showed to one another, right? And in terms of the culture of care, uh, whilst we have structures in terms of uh, touch-based sessions, you know, conversations with teachers, I think what I thought to do that probably made a difference was to personally engage the teachers whom I felt uh, would need more help. For example, the teachers who might be struggling with ICT, you know, I'll just drop them a message or when they come to school, uh, when they, on the days that they could, I will ask them how they are doing, right? And if they have children at home, I'll ask them, how, did your, how are your children doing at home? You know, in addition to you helping the students that you are teaching in school. And if they have difficulty in ICT, we, I also ask them, how are you doing in that area? So basically I kept a pulse on uh, the, the, how the staff was doing. And we also took care of the, uh, what we call the executive and admin staff or the non-teaching staff, because they were providing a lot of support. So under the culture of discipline, with the discipline mindset and structures put in place, we managed to continue our business. The, continuous, the business continuity plan was put in, in place very, very quickly. Um, we were in constant contact with the teachers, constant monitoring of students' well-being and constant communication with our parents. We've got all our structures and platforms to be able to do so. And because everything had to be scaled down, there was also the necessity to choose the essential. And there was an effort by program owners um, to make sure that despite the challenges, they would be able to bring the experiences that they have planned for the children. And I, I would say a large portion of the school experience was therefore maintained in the school in the midst of all these uh, challenges. The innovation mindset and skill set also served us well. Our students responded positively to assignments and invitations to participate in what we call the home-based limited edition challenge. We knew that emotionally, socially, the children were feeling isolated and we wanted to engage them in something challenging and interesting and new experiences. We took the risk of simply giving them that challenge and um, we were very surprised with uh, the reception of both uh, parents and children. The parents collaborated with the children to submit entries for Root Goldberg uh, challenges, creative art and video clips of their learning. And that we, we had a really, really good surprise. And the idea of care went, went, went beyond the physical and social and mental well-being of our students and staff to the larger community. 
we were ahead of some national initiatives to support the children whose parents were affected by the pandemic. And I'm very proud of the school's initiative to bring cheer to our foreign workers, working with their parents, the children had translations in order to uh, send out messages of love and care uh, through songs in several languages um, that, uh, uh, that could be appreciated by the foreign workers, especially in the dormitories. So it is not really hard for us to appreciate the importance of investing in a positive culture that made it possible for us to care for our school community. We drastically search for best actions for the worst case scenarios. And there you have it. Basic school services, which are usually conducted physically or face-to-face, -face, were made available online or digital. I am blessed to be a part of a strong and dedicated workforce, our administration team, my co-teachers and staff. With them exerting extra miles enabled us to continue our basic school operations. With these initiatives, at first, we were not aware. Oh, 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 then we are now then starting to build a culture of relationships with high hopes and positivity in the new normal with our community. We even coordinated with higher offices for possible support, as well as employing shared governance among parents and community leaders. We made a big leap towards creating a virtual relationship to our school community. Online platforms were created and was generally updated time to time, day to day, maximizing our use of the ever popular mainstream media to provide learning with all our three groups of learners being with enough, limited, or no resources at all. Thanks to the Head Foundation, through your certificate in uh, Educational Studies and Leadership Program, and with Dr. Vicente Reyes of the Queensland University, together with my colleagues, together with my transformation team, we invested heavily on three-point key agenda. First, a positive culture of practices. Second, maximization of digital technology. And third, stakeholders participation. I usually made analogies, quoting, my dear parents and pupils, how about we all join in a marathon? But instead of running faster, or running alone. How about we all run together? Look and care for each other. No learner must be left behind, be it online or printed media. Our mantra, if we cannot bring our learners to the school, then we should bring them or we should bring the school to them. We even maximize our relationship to our ever supportive government where they provided us with printed modules. Yes, printed modules. These materials are the answers to most of our learners with limited or having no resources at all. Hygiene kits were provided to teachers. Regular deliveries of nutritious breads or buns for our kindergarten pupils and fresh milk for our undernourished learners. The city government, in coordination to our education division offices, launched the popularized Facebook Live television. We call it the Valenzuela Live, where 
learners across all grade levels are hooked to a regular schedule of live lessons. Well, this is not an issue to our learners with enough capacities in ICT and with faster internet connectivity. To bridge the gap, our learners, their families, considered to be poorest of the poor in the city, or those, again, with limited or no resources at all, were provided with smartphones, free. Yes, you heard it, free smartphones by our ever supportive local government. In our school alone, there were 200 plus individual beneficiaries of such gadgets. Thank you, thank you uh, for that really inspiring account, uh, uh, John, of um, not, outside outside help but within the community so that it was always there it's just that you reached out to it and i suspect that you couldn't have done this if you did not already have that relationship before covid 19. yeah so relationships matter no matter at what time So for training, uh, we initially focus on the ICT skills prior to the, lock, the school lockdown. So prior to the school lockdown, the government hasn't announced anything about it. But then uh, there is a trend that there is a signal that it's going to happen. So I made a quick decision to have this face to face uh, training regarding ICT, but the face-to-face two-day ICT training, face-to-face, -face, but it's classical approach, but uh, moving from this classical approach, we are then uh, giving opportunities also for teachers uh, to receive a, the similar training by coaching and so it's not a training but it's coaching and mentoring where they can work in smaller groups with their peers or colleagues and apart from that uh, at the initial stage although we are working from home some teachers who feel that they need uh, assistance in terms of technicality, in terms of technology, they can always come to schools and conduct their teaching at schools. There are always support team who are ready to assist them. So schools are always open for them so that they feel uh, comfortable with their, their the technology. They're not worried about technical problem. And at the same time, they are not worried about the connectivity either. Teachers should feel confident about their ICT literacy and their teachings. And students' learning is to be adjusted with the specific needs during the pandemic. And this is uh, what we were trying to achieve uh, to meet the criteria or the standard uh, from the government as a response to the study uh, teaching learning activities during the pandemic. And it is also important to ensure teacher's physical and mental health. So in Bahasa Indonesia, the word teacher is guru. Guru stands for digugu and ditiru. Literally means trusted and followed. So a teacher is someone who is trusted and followed. But this well-known notion uh, uh, challenged me with this unpredictability of uh, the school practices, unpredictability of the future. Can we still take this well-known notion for granted? Is a teacher always someone who can be followed, who can be trusted and followed? And that is why I make my own definition of a teacher. So my definition is a true teacher is a lifelong learner who never stops to improve him and herself. I actually have been thinking about these questions and 
I think uh, I'm talking about teacher collaboration, so I will answer in terms of teachers' perspectives. So uh, I think there is a culture of learning when teachers feel that they need, uh, they don't feel obliged when they, you know, when they have to take a PDA sessions or a training, they feel the need to do it more than a need, they enjoy it, they find solace in doing it, and they find contentment. And I am so proud, and this is what I have seen from my teachers, because there is also a question about, regarding with the so many education policy changes, there are actually online training by the government. Nobody is requiring teacher to take it. No, it's their own initiative. And the majority of teachers in my school, they are taking this regarding assess assessment, the replacement of the national examination and other content in the changes. Yeah, so I think, yeah, when the teachers enjoy learning, so there is a culture of learning. Empowerment through intentional, sustained professional development is another critical ingredient for a strong learning culture in the school. Sustained professional development throughout the year equips teachers with deep skills and conceptual understanding and enables, and enables them to design engaging and enjoyable uh, lessons. At Kochuan Presbyterian Secondary School, time is set aside on a fortnightly basis for teachers to come together to sharpen pedagogical skills and to learn the new skills that may be uh, needed for every cycle of change in their curriculum. Teachers are also encouraged to participate in learning opportunities at intra-school and national platforms. Uh, here we see a teachers from the science department learning together. At, as, at KCPSS, we, cre we prioritize creating space and time for teachers to toy with various teaching and learning strategies in order to birth new ideas and innovative ways of engaging students for deep learning. Every teacher is allocated time and funds are also made available for teachers to develop good ideas into teaching tools that they can use in their classes. Opportunities are also provided for teachers to share their innovations in teaching strategies at national and international platforms. Such experiences promote staff collegiality and encourage teamwork and experimentation among staff, thus strengthening the culture of team learning among staff. Here we see students engaged in learning concepts in geography using a board game that was designed and produced by our own teachers. The learning here is self-directed and students are having fun. Lessons are designed to allow inquiry and exploration so that students can draw their own conclusions about important issues. And this promotes engagement and enjoyment in the class. All this is evidence of how when teachers are motivated learners themselves, the joy of learning is naturally passed on to students. And this project done by our teachers was actually shared at an international conference. And uh, such, a, such, a, such a great phrase for us all as value ed educators to remember that we are build, helping our children, each of them, to build their future. And all this from a journey of many small steps that these led to not only successful outcomes, but I think essentially built up the spirit of the school because the principal and the teachers believed that every student can learn. Wow. This is a very common saying. Many of you would, would know this. Um, it says it takes a village to raise a child. But I would propose that it actually takes a village to raise a good teacher. Because as those of us who are teachers well know, skills and competencies takes years to build and takes a lot of mentors and people who would journey alongside us. So you may then ask like, well, how do we sustain this whole ecosystem of learning? So there is that ministry level, there is that school level. But for the teacher himself or herself, we believe very strongly in this concept of teacher ownership, teacher leadership. 
the teacher must lead his or her own learning. He or she has agency, empowerment, not an automaton, not someone to be dictated to as to how you learn and what, what you want to learn. So what we do is that there is an availability, there's a plethora of courses for the teacher development and for them to choose from. So in Singapore, we have different levels of like teachers. So you may start with a beginning teacher and you're given a lot of support as a beginning teacher at a school level. And then you can move on to becoming a senior teacher after a few years of experience. And then you find that you can actually lead other teachers in your subject area. And then you can even graduate to become a lead teacher. And perhaps what is um, quite interesting is this idea that teachers can learn outside of the school and outside of the school context or education context. There is a teacher work attachment scheme that is available for teachers to apply and they can go outside of the industry or to other industries. Um, some of them have gone to museums, some of them have gone to IT, some of them have gone to um, certain industries um, such as like service industry, hotels, uh, as well as, as different, different kinds of industries basically in order to enrich their understanding of the world of work. Because we do understand and we do uh, realize that sometimes education, if you just keep looking inwards, it can be quite inward looking. And we really need something that will stimulate the teacher's um, imagination, that will help them understand what, what the world of work is looking for. And then to, to inspire them to want to try new things and bring new practices into the classroom. In conclusion, in the case of Singapore, there is great support for culture of learning as well as at the school level, systems level, and the individual level as well. I think time and resources are very important. I want to say that this culture of learning didn't happen overnight. It took, it took many, many years. I remember um, it really took on a great impetus somewhere around 1997. And uh, the first announcement came up that every teacher is entitled to 100 hours of learning per year. I think many teachers nearly fell off their chairs. It's like, how do I do? What do you mean 100 hours of learning a, per year? And this is like your right to go on courses up to 100 hours a year. It just seemed like a lot of time. But um, we have found that after an adjustment period, teachers actually found that it's really refreshing to go for course. And it helps them to teach better. And you find the principles relaxing as well. So, okay, when I release my teachers for a course, they come back, recharge re and re-energize. It's worth it. It's worth investing in that time for staff learning. So now 100 hours is, is really not, not much. If you hear from LC, right? They, they have like um, once a fortnight, they have staff learning sessions. So all these things all build up, but it, it, it makes it very exciting to teach because you know you're not going to stagnate. You know that you're always going to, to be learning new things from your peers. Of course, at the systems level, there is always a continuous review of approaches to teacher learning and even student learning. Because as times have changed, we find that um, our teachers need to learn new skills. Digital skills being one example, but also differentiated um, teaching. Like how do we teach uh, different students with different abilities, with different learning styles? So, did some of the, so these are some of the things that are still an ongoing journey for us. And so again, you know, for you, I, I, I really wish for you to start applying maybe some of these ideas in a small way, and then let's see how far it, it takes you. Yes, we are still in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Some of us are still grappling with the need to create, new, uh, to create access to learning for our students through technology. My view is that we need to think beyond the current situation. We must look ahead and start laying the right foundations to prepare the, for the next challenge. We need to build and strengthen the people-to-people -people relationships. Let me suggest three practical points. Firstly, you have to invest time with stakeholders. Connect with students, teachers, parents, and other partners to understand their needs and concerns. You must engage and invite stakeholders to take ownership of these issues and involve them to find solutions together with you. And thirdly, 
you need to make effort to build trust by giving support and at the same time expect accountability from all stakeholders in alignment to school goals. We started off realizing, right, in schools everywhere in the region that we were facing a crisis. The lockdowns, the prolonged school closures, the need for online learning, these were things we had never experienced before. And especially our needy students were most in danger because of their lack of resources and because even of their lack of food sometimes. This needed leadership and empathy. And in fact, that formed the subject for that first webinar series. We talked a lot on the, 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 the form that leadership had to take. But with this second series, it was a recognition that leaders cannot do it on their own. They must do it with their community, with their internal community, as well as the external. And for that, we needed to build up the school culture. School culture was in fact that unseen force that had very visible outcomes. And school culture rested on the relationships being built. Today we saw that school culture is maintained and refreshed because it is a culture that constantly learns and constantly adapts. This, you have said, is the way to ride the wave of change. And through it all, I hear from speakers the very genuine need to be relevant and to show you care. Doing what makes meaning to your school community doing what shows your genuine concern for them goes a long, long way to creating that trust that would help you lead your school into the new normal.